Africa and Europe are mutually dependent. Our continents are neighbors. We share opportunities and challenges. Earlier this year, at the World Economic Forum, Chancellor Angela Merkel said, we should finally understand that being partners on an equal footing with Africa is not only charitable, but it can also be mutually enriching. We need a reset in the relations between Africa and Europe based on a common political vision. The African Union and the European Union are engaged in the negotiation process aimed at the new strategic partnership agreement. This is an opportunity for new ideas and new approaches. The joint communications on the European Union's Africa strategy published on the 9th of March set out the themes that the EU and the African counterparts will work on in the coming months. With the growing uncertainties of the COVID-19 crisis is presenting worldwide and the economic consequences following the pandemic, the relationship between Africa and Europe is even more crucial. The EU and the European countries are the most important economic partners of African countries. Norway is in a unique position. We are part of Europe, but not a member of the EU. We have a long history of solidarity, support and partnership with African countries and anti-colonial liberal movements. For Norway, it is essential that we bring African voices into the discussions. Development aid is still an important part of our relationship with African countries. But equally important, our bilateral relationships with an increasing number of African countries are broadening and deepening. We have political and security dialogues. We engage on multilateral issues and have a number of commercial partnerships and the number is increasing. Our private sector is looking for opportunities in many countries and in new sectors. Our relationship uh, with AU and African countries are based on strategic partnerships where we can engage and address common opportunities and challenges. Our agenda is very broad. Peace and security, respect for human rights, environment and climate change, the blue economy and maritime security, renewable energy, promoting digitalization, the SDGs and education, and final, uh, financial transparency and combating illicit financial flows and strengthening the multilateralisms are just some of the key areas in this partnership. Our partnerships were on a positive track. However, the pandemic has disrupted political, economic and social fabric in Africa and in Europe. We now need to take stock of the short and medium term effects of COVID-19 on the African-Europe relationship. The government of Norway is pleased to support today's discussion. This first roundtable will be a part of a new initiative that will stimulate and enrich the dialogue in Africa and Europe on the underlying geopolitical dynamics. Dynamics that will influence the strategic relationships between Africa and Europe. We are very proud to partner with the African Centre for Constructive Resolution of Disputes, the European Council on Foreign Relations and the Norwegian Institute on International Affairs, NUPI. And with these short remarks, I would like to hand over the virtual floor to NUPI, who will guide us through the discussions on how the COVID-19 will affect the relationship between Africa and Europe. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne, uh, for kicking us off. And uh, you've already raised, I think, a number of issues which will inform our debate and that we will come back to. And it was 
I think very useful to position Norway in this context as well. So I'm going to hand the floor to Vasu Gauden, the Executive Director of Accord. After him, we're going to go to Ganilla Carlson, uh, who's a former Deputy Chief Executive of UNAIDS, and of course, uh, also a former uh, Foreign Minister of, or Development Minister rather, of, of Sweden. And after that, we will have some questions and answer session on this first part of the debate. So uh, Vasu, over to you. Thank you very much. No, Cedric, thank you very much. And uh, let me uh, start by uh, thanking uh, your government, Mariana, for uh, generously sponsoring these uh, dialogues. Uh, I think it is uh, very important that uh, we have, as you po pointed out, uh, African and European voices dialoguing on what our partnership should look like uh, going into the future. Uh, Fatan will deal with the trade issues. I'm not a trade expert. Uh, I will look at it more from a security perspective and how COVID-19 uh, really has become a uh, conflict multiplier in a sense. And uh, what that has done for uh, security on the continent and uh, how that will then influence the relationship between an, uh, Africa and Europe and uh, more importantly, how should it affect the relationship between uh, Africa and Europe? And Cedric, I did promise you that I would put my stopwatch on, so let me do that also. So, uh, over, uh, step the mark here on time. Let, uh, colleagues, about six weeks ago, when flights had stopped and uh, there was an impending lockdown, uh, we got together as an institution and said there is a crisis that uh, is emerging on the continent. Uh, it's a health crisis, but it will have intended and unintended consequences, uh, particularly in relation to the spread of the virus and then measures taken to stem the spread of the virus. So we set up a task unit here at Accord with around 15 of our staff to track on a daily basis uh, conflict indicators in all the countries on the continent on seven conflict drivers or conflict indicators and categories of conflict. Uh, we started to produce on a weekly basis a conflict uh, and resilience monitor uh, to provide some analysis uh, more for early warning of what will happen on the continent. So. The current issue, the fifth issue, has just been released. What have been our findings the last couple of weeks? Firstly, conflict, uh, social and political conflict, has actually decreased on the continent. Secondly, uh, crime has also decreased on the continent. But there are some categories of crime that has increased, particularly gender-based violence. As we have seen, this is not just on the continent, but globally as well. And then we have seen an increase also in insurgencies on the continent. Now, why has there been a drop in political and social conflict on the continent, particularly in many countries on the continent which have been vulnerable and where we have seen political and uh, social conflict? The reason is that lockdowns and other measures that were taken to stem or rather to flatten the curve of uh, the pandemic uh, has actually put a lid on uh, conflict on the continent. A dangerous lid, I should add, because the vulnerabilities that we had prior to the lockdowns have actually increased now with the economic and social dislocations that have come from the measures. And these are the unintended consequences. And this is what uh, our findings have shown, is that yes, conflicts have decreased, but now there is the potential for increased social and political conflict. So if you look at this week's monitor, and there are three uh, analysis that I want to uh, refer to. The first is by Carlos Lopez, the former executive secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. And what he says is, whilst the rest of the world will go probably, not probably, will go into recession in many parts, uh, for Africa, most African countries will actually go into depression. This will be very serious economic dislocation on the continent that will have far-reaching consequences. Secondly, the second article is an article penned by the president of ECOWAS, Brow, and the UNSRSG for West Africa and the Sahel Chambas. And they argue that with uh, 
the growing nationalism, authoritarianism, etc., we have to safeguard human rights. And this is going to be a crucial aspect related to uh, what happens on the continent in the post-lockdown period, not even in the post-COVID period. The third article is an article by two professors, Basado and Ditch, and they argue that violence will come not now through the virus, but as we have said, through the economic and uh, social dislocations that will take place. Now, colleagues, what does all this then have to do with EU and uh, Africa relationships? And I, I want to say that uh, we have to ensure that Africa in the future will not experience the same kind of vulnerabilities because the virus has spread across the world, but the impact that it will have in, uh, uh, in ensuring that more countries become extremely vulnerable to the unintended consequences is something that we should avoid for the future. How can we avoid that? And what does, again, does this have to do with our relationships? to do with the fact that there has not been much economic transformation on the continent. If we had uh, economic transformation that has dealt with the deep structural issues on the continent, we would not find these fragilities and vulnerabilities that we see now occurring as we're moving into the future. So if we take again the relationship between Europe and Africa, so I looked today at Eurostats, and Eurostats is giving the official uh, statistics uh, from uh, European countries. And what Eurostats says, and these are April 2020 uh, statistics, it says in 2019, almost 70% of goods exported from the European Union to Africa were manufactured goods. Secondly, in 2019 again, over 65% of goods imported into the European Union from Africa were primary goods, food and drink, raw materials and energy. And when you look at the graph that Eurostats produces, you will see that most of them have to uh, are on raw materials that have been exported from Africa. Very little has to do with food and drink and then a, a percentage on energy. This kind of relationship, and Mariana, I know that you have said that what uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel has indicated is that we're looking for a relationship of equality. But the relationship of equality is something that will be far into the future, simply because of this disjuncture that we are seeing, the trade uh, imbalances, etc. How can we rectify this? And I want to now, uh, Cedric, move uh, to a point where I think that we have to focus not so much on uh, trade uh, that is quantitative, but rather a relationship based on trade that is qualitative. And let me explain. If we look at the statistics that come out of Eurostat, those statistics are quantitative statistics about the amount of trade that we are doing between Europe and Africa. But if we want to actually see transformation in Africa, then it can't be about economic trade. It has to be economic trade that results in economic transformation. Largely, our problems and our vulnerabilities on the continent stem from the fact that we are largely uh, an agrarian society on the continent. Now, agrarian in subsistence agrarian, not even commercial agrarian. That's why even food security will become a major problem. We have not moved in most of the countries, except maybe here in our own country, South Africa, maybe some of the North African countries. We have not transformed from an agrarian society to industrial, to a uh, services sector, and now into the fourth industrial revolution. If that does not change, if those deep structural problems that we still experience and challenges don't change. It is not going to change with the kind of figures that we are seeing from Eurostat. So we need to, if we talk about resetting that relationship, that's the first thing. The second around that is that when we talk about elections and governance also, if we talk about elections and governments in a quantitative way, then we talk about state capacity. But development will not come from just state capacity. It has to come from state capacity, coupled with a qualitative state capability. And here again, in our relationship 
with our neighbors, with our colleagues, when we begin to talk about a reciprocal relationship of exchange of information, of uh, expertise, etc., then we need to be talking about a transformation from capacity to capability. How do we do that? And then thirdly, of course, on our side, we have to ensure also that the policies that we put in place are followed by political will. And if there isn't the political will that is then followed by uh, implementation, uh, then of course we on our side will not be uh, able to move from a relationship that goes from quality to equality. So I think if we talk about equality, Mariana, then we're talking about this somewhere down the line, but it has to be premised by a relationship based on quality and that uh, quality relationship has to refer to how do we ensure that there is benefic uh, beneficiation. If there is no beneficiation, then youth employment, which we talk about uh, all the time, and youth unemployment is going to be a big problem now on the continent, youth employment will become a fiction. And then we have to say, what kind of relationship are we going to leave this generation, those of us that are sitting here uh, today, what relationship will we leave for our children, the children of Europe and Africa, those children who will be neighbors, continue to be neighbors in the future? Will we be creating uh, walls of fear or will we be creating bridges of hope for them? Now I want to leave it there and say, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult in seven minutes not to give you a, sign, a sound bite. But we can go deeper into the discussion, I hope not only here, but as we move into the future so that we can interrogate what a quality relationship looks like and a relationship based on quality that leads to the dealing with the deep structural challenges that will bring us to equality. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much, Vasu. And, and uh, you introduced yourself as not an economist, but then you spend quite a bit of time talking about economy. So. It looks like a conflict resolution experts these days have to be economists as well. And thank you very much for, uh, for reminding us, of course, that you know, most of the structural inequalities and vulnerabilities that have existed prior to the COVID-9 pandemic has only been further exacerbated uh, by the pandemic and, and, and adds further to the complexity that we need to deal with also in this relationship. So now I have the opportunity to, to, to go to Gunilla. Um, Gunilla, if you could uh, uh, um, come near, I understand you're going to talk about uh, managing a global health crisis together. How should Europe and Africa work together on global health? Floors over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's really a pleasure to be here. And uh, the reset is very welcome and timely. Thanks to Marianne Hagen and Norway to make sure that we now don't lose track due to the pandemic. Because I think this is also an opportunity for us to uh, have reflection, but equally also forward thinking uh, together with partners and to see how the EU-Africa partnership uh, can, can take things forward. First, I'd like to remind ourselves that uh, we have our diversities. Neither Europe nor Africa is an homogeneous entity with identical interests. Our continents are composed of extraordinary variety of backgrounds, histories, national interests, and social political preconditions. Uh, our governance structures as well, if we compare AU and EU, and including Norway in that, there are differences, different stages of maturity, I would like to say, but it's built on shared values. And that's why I think we really have to welcome so much uh, that the new commissioner commission under the leadership of Ursula von der Leyen uh, only a few months after assuming office she had prepared and presented the comprehensive partnership between the European Union and Africa and I think there is a great deal of undiscovered and untouched potential in our cooperation uh, with the African continent building on this green growth model, improving the business environment and investment climate, boosting education, research, innovation, the creation of decent jobs, and maximizing the uh, benefits of regional African economic integration and trade, combating climate change and making sure that there is access to sustainable energy 
And of course, it was mentioned peace and security. All this is to me the agenda 2030 and everything is also linked to how you can have healthier societies. So I hope that this pandemic cannot distort the long potential that's there, the long-term potential that's there with the EU-African partnership. And perhaps also the collaboration around health, equity and pandemic response can move beyond classical development assistance. Uh, as a starting point there, I think it's obvious for uh, Africa and European Union that we need multilateral collaboration. Uh, for example, now with the debate around WHO, it's equally important for both EU and Africa to have a reform agenda for the World Health Organization and perhaps to develop that together. We need the political, not only the practical collaboration between us. Because uh, this is, of course, a health crisis, but we have seen also that uh, Europe can learn from Africa. Uh, the Ebola outbreak has shown weaknesses within the WHO system, but equally also what I've seen uh, in that response that the African communities realized how to have swift, swift detection, early testing and rapid response with cross-border collaboration and strong solidarity between the different neighboring African states in that outbreak. So I think there are a lot of lessons learned in the area of health where we also from a European side can be inspired by Africa in the long-term perspectives. Because today to rebuild back better and to have viable health systems, we have to learn on a scale of innovations that we haven't seen before, but also what I very humbly learn from African responses, the work with community-led responses. And I think there is another area of inspiration and recognition about the capacity within Africa, where also an aging European Union can benefit and learn about. Can I just say a few words on Africa's COVID-19 reality? There has, of course, been a very tough time now with the socio-economically very unstable countries with its weak uh, health systems. I looked into figures, for example, where Sweden spends 5,000 US dollars a year per capita on its health for the people. Ethiopia, with its growing population, spends about 25 US dollars a year. It's a huge gap and that can't immediately be filled. And that's why I'm talking about how can we innovate together and build strong health systems, but equally continue beyond a development cooperation to see that there can become more equity. I like to take the opportunity to warn that Africa still are suffering and fighting many other viruses, for example, HIV. The fight against HIV, TB and malaria needs enormous investments and we have come far but for example HIV is far from over and it's weakening public health systems on the low level that's there and I'm now worried that the new debate and the new pandemic will take out that there has been a lot of uh, needs in the uh, health systems and the strengthening of the health systems in Africa has been happening but from very very low levels. Um, the domestic financing is still minor in general and the risk now is that many nations will be fiscally squeezed and uh, invest less in their health systems uh, and, and that will be um, a really dangerous time for that. We also see that there is of course dependency in Africa from many other mayor actors and uh, I think it, we can talk more, but at another occasion, on the debt level, levels that now are building up in Africa with less transparency than we had earlier, uh, and also the risk that this will also affect the, the health systems in, in the long-term uh, view. Uh, the economic forecast that we have seen is, is really seeing now how the virus, not in itself, but the response in, for example, in Europe, is really moving the figures from a rather stable growth in Africa to becoming a, a decline. Uh, 
the World Bank's estimates are really, really scary when we look to the risk for nations becoming weaker and, and less prosperous and not being able to grow and develop as, as planned, but equally also to see that it can throw more people into poverty, hunger, and perhaps also uh, anger. Uh, on the real economy and the pocket spending on health, one should also be very much aware about the financial aspects when it comes to remittances that many times have helped people to survive over the day. And now when remittances as well are shrinking, uh, we might find more and more people on the African continent uh, moving back into to, to real poverty. However, I think it's timely also to see how the Africa as such has responded to the COVID. The central banks across Africa has taken a leading role in tackling the economic consequences. There has been a unique, I must say, proactive response with Ghana and Kenya, uh, South African Reserve Bank that initi initiated buying bonds uh, uh, in the secondary market to boost liquidity and a lot of other things that we have to look into we look at as such because this is for Africa not a virus problem, economic problem. I think also, if we are honest from a European Union point of view, despite all challenges with the poverty, corruption, unstable and not perhaps too viable health systems, the African political leadership has been very vigilant since the outbreak. The African Union has shown a really proactive approach already in February, uh, to, to make sure that they have supported the African Center for the Disease Control and giving them a leading role. And very, very early on in February, whilst the European Union still struggled to find a common ground for a unified approach, the African CDC, as the, a body to the African Union, had through the partnership to accelerate COVID-19 testing, the so-called PACT, they managed to, to, to give a very important impetus. Of course, the implementation can't be as strong as we would like to hope, but I think the political will, commitment, and leadership we have seen must be um, strengthened, uh, must be endorsed and, and congratulated. Um, I could go on and on and, and to give you good examples, what we have seen from a political angle when it comes to what the African Union have done but also on the technology side and to see where European Union with its new partnership with Africa also can work on digital solutions and innovations. Unfortunately, the, the continental free trade agreement with Africa put digitalization rather low. But I think also now when we have the free trade agreement in Africa and to make sure that the, the potential of digitalization and digitalization in health could be an equal arena for EU and Africa together to work upon because we have seen uh, of course in Europe as such but equally also in Africa some digital solutions to fight back, back towards 19 and, and I think that is also important to raise. Overall we know that with 10% increased digitalization in Africa there is a potential of a raise with 1% of the GDP, GNP uh, and that will of course also have long-term uh, effects. Uh, so um, with that, I tried to not doom and gloom with the health figures and weak health systems, but tried to say that we have an untapped arena when it comes to global health to give really life uh, to the new partnership agreements. And uh, I hope that Europe will not let this opportunity slip. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunilla. It was very good to get your, your uh, view, your perspective, especially from your previous work with UNAIDS and your, your experience in public health. And it was interesting to hear about the lessons that you highlighted that, that has been uh, learned or that we can draw on from the experience with Ebola and HIV AIDS and so on on the African continent. Um, and also thank you for highlighting a number of areas of, of potential future cooperation. Uh, and for highlighting in the relationship that, that's coming up. So, so this is Alain Leroy.
I know fa many familiar places here, like Saijinit and many others. Uh, as you just said, I've just appointed by uh, President Macron has his special envoy for the call for action, which has been signed by, as you know, by uh, 18 head of states, both from Europe and Africa, and published in Financial Times and Jeune Afrique on 15 April to increase uh, international support on short term. My, my task is very much on short term, how to we can mobilize more support to help Africa facing this crisis. As you said perfectly well, this is a sanitary crisis, but uh, already very much an economic crisis in Africa. So we are working with four AU African Union special envoy, Mr. Tijan Diam, uh, Dr. Ngozi, Trevor Manuel, and, and uh, President Kabeho, and I work very much with the international functions, the World Bank and, I, and the IMF, especially on the debt issue. Uh, this is short term, but of course with a long, long term implication. As you have seen, there, there has been an agreement on the suspension of the debt at the last G20 in the club, Paris Club. Uh, we are now uh, enforcing, making sure with, through the Club of Paris, Paris Club, that this moratorium, the suspension of the debt, is fully implemented by all the creditors. And as I think Gunilla said, or, or someone else before, this is very important we, to have more and more transparency on this. That is a, a key point for us. So we, we work with that and we look also at the end, by the end of the year to speak of cancellation on some debt for those, of course, for the debt will be unsustainable. So I don't want to be too long, but we're working on that. We're working on so many other issues together again with the special envoy of the African Union. Uh, and, and with the aim, the link between short term and long term will be the EU, AU summit, which is still planned for the end of October. And then we have to address both the short term issue, how the EU can help more uh, African Union, uh, the Africa and African Union, and of course to, to discuss uh, the long term partnership. And the, the more urgent thing for the time being is to ensure that in the, in the, in the assistance that the EU is going, is giving for COVID all over the world, the share of Africa is quite significant for the timings. The figure here is 6.24 billion euros, uh, both the Commission and EIB. But I think that's, that's very important that that continues because we know that the, the needs of Africa during this period in 2020 is enormous. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alain. Um, I recognize uh, Said Jinnit and uh, Kiza. Uh, so let me first go to, uh, to Mr. Jinnit. Uh, said you have the floor. I see you are, are muted. Uh, maybe just unmute yourself. Okay. Greetings to all colleagues for participating in this conference. I just make some one or two remarks. Uh, just to say that uh, in the next month and perhaps more, the focus of African and European countries will continue to be on addressing the impact of COVID-19. Substantial part of existing EU resources have been redirected to assist African countries to address COVID to the detriment of other development projects. This will prob probably continue until the end of the COVID crisis after the development and generalization of the vaccine, medicine and testing. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to the post postponement of the series of meetings devoted to discussing the new strategy between Africa and Europe. It has affected the momentum and the very ambitious timeline adopted by the EU leadership at its assumption of function for the finalization of the Africa-Europe strategy. From my point of view, despite its heavy internal agenda, the EU will remain committed to development of the Africa-Europe strategy because this has a strategic importance for them, especially in the current context of competition between external powers in Africa. The EU shares the same commitment because it has the feeling of shared destiny with Europe. The process will be obviously delayed because of the circumstances. The two partners may have to resort like us to vision, to uh, visio conference, to pursue their consultations. But was, what is more important to me, my view, is that the proposed strategy takes into account the interest of both 
Group X. The development of the new strategy is a golden opportunity for both parties to embark on an audacious strategic relation supported by a binding framework based on shared values and mutual commitments with appropriate follow-up mechanisms. The AU has been putting forward a number of ideas. Africa should also put forward its priorities for the Africa-Europe strategy. It is only if it is perceived as being fair and beneficial to both parties that the strategy will be effective and sustainable. This is my comment at this point. Thank you so much, Sajanit. Uh, Kiza, um, over to you. We only have about eight minutes left, so if you can just take a, a minute or two, and that gives our speakers also an opportunity to answer in case you have any questions that you want to raise. Go ahead. Kiza. Yes, I'm sure I will not even uh, reach two minutes because I have questions and not a uh, comment. So uh, my first question is about uh, the inclusion of, let's say, or maybe collaboration with uh, the diaspora. Especially, uh, I think the point about remittances has been made. Uh, we know that diaspora remits not only financial, but also other form of uh, resources. So I was wondering, uh, in this conversation, when it's come to EU-Africa relationship, uh, what, what is your view about diaspora communities residing in Europe? What could be their added value uh, in this uh, COVID and post-COVID uh, conversation, but also on the broader uh, strategic uh, conversations? And the second um, a point, and uh, maybe it's a big question, but I was wondering what you think uh, the opportunities can be, can, can be uh, from this uh, pandemic. I understand the, the distinction uh, oh, the warning by Carlos Lopez about uh, an economic depression, um, no, actually even sharper. Um, but I was wondering whether this crisis could also create an opportunity. I'm aware that's a big question, but so far I've, I've heard only warnings and, uh, and um, yeah, apocalyptic scenarios. But I, I wonder whether you also see uh, opportunities that can arise from this crisis. Thank you very much, Kiza. You, you remind me, I think, of the quote that, uh, uh, that uh, goes along the lines of uh, never miss uh, a good, uh, the opportunity that a good crisis creates to perhaps uh, bring some new, new approaches to, to various things. I understand we also have uh, Jarmun Setter from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Norway. Uh, Jarmun, would you like to make a comment or question? Uh, two comments, uh, more in a type of brainstorming mood. Uh, uh, there's no doubt that um, COVID-19 crisis will have a very serious um, impact on African economies. But again, I think uh, in a larger perspective, uh, learn us uh, a lesson about how we in Europe uh, also need to look um, at uh, African countries uh, in a different way. Um, we have all assumed that uh, the population of African countries would be uh, much harder hit and more or less be struck down by the COVID-19 pandemic. That might still happen, uh, we are not sure, but I think we might also reflect a bit on why did we automatically more or less assume that um, the number of deaths, for example, in many African countries would be much higher in Europe. It hasn't happened yet. And as I said, it can happen again. But uh, <clears throat> for the wider work on um, Europe-Africa strategy, we should pause a bit and think about uh, why did we automatically assume that um, the number of deaths would be much larger in African countries. Again, the economic consequences of COVID-19, it's much more serious. And I agree with Vasu on that. Um, but uh, we, we might need to reflect a bit uh, in terms of how we relate to, to African countries uh, when we make a new strategy. Also in this sense that, um, uh, you know, um, there are many measures taken by African governments already that um, has proven to be good. And as uh, has been mentioned by others, uh, some of African countries have a lot of experience in in uh, fighting pandemic, pandemics. Another issue I just want to briefly mention, um, State Minister Hagen uh, 
uh, mentioned the issue of multilateral cooperation. And we might get more into that in the next session, but I think uh, the way the World Health Organization is uh, squeezed between one major power in the West and one, one major power in the East uh, is just uh, underline how much uh, interest we have uh, in common between Europe and Africa in terms of uh, working together to safeguard the multilateral system and to safeguard important institutions like the World Health Organizations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jarman. Um, let me turn to Vasu and to Gunilla. I'll start with Gunilla and give her the opportunity in reverse order. Uh, if you can just take perhaps one minute each uh, and comment on, on what you've heard before we go into the next session. Thank you so much, Gunilla. Thank you. And I think it was rather very good comments. Uh, but on the question on the diaspora and the untapped potential, because I think this is also shows how interlinked we are and how much now immediately the economic lockdown in all of the world is of course a, a huge problem for the diaspora and remittances because many, many are those that are also losing their jobs, whether it's in the Gulf or, or if it's in Sweden. So we have to be aware about that, but also to see how much in the long term uh, with giving the space and working in partnership with diaspora and diaspora organizations uh, to make sure that the partnership now with EU Africa is not only a political one, but to make it very, very viable and being able to make sure that there are instruments to make sure that you can perhaps fast forward some investments or to make sure that the remittances are really being used in a way that could help with economic growth. And that's why I mentioned the bottom-up approach to work with communities and to make sure that we uh, are not coming into a mood where we are too apocalyptic or where we are just devastated about what we do see now. I, I think we have to bring hope and to show that there are areas for, for collaboration. I'm not sure that the COVID crisis is yet over for Africa, but they acted very, very harsh and hard. Uh, but no doubt that the economic crisis due to how the rest of the world has responded is the thing we really have to work upon now and move beyond the immediate health challenge. Because unfortunately, a lot of people in Africa are suffering because they don't even have access to clean water. A lot of kids are yet not uh, immune, immunized. Uh, and I mentioned the HIV uh, unfinished business, just as an example. So yes, we have a tremendous amount of work ahead, but if we move now to an inclusive agenda and much more genuine, I think this is a very, very good opportunity for Africa-EU collaboration. And so also to work on the multilateral institutions that were set, but also to hold the there are perhaps sustainable depth, oh well, whatever. I think Europe has to keep this and, and not distort from its own value-based law and order uh, tradition and, and constitution. Uh, and that is also what we have together with the Thank others. you so much, Thank Gunilla. You. Vasu, over to you, and maybe you can also touch on the question Kiza raised about the opportunities that you see in the COVID-19. Thank you, Cedric. Uh, Kiza. Firstly, you know, on the uh, issue of the diaspora, you know, the AU sees the diaspora as the sixth region. So without a doubt, uh, we must include uh, diaspora voices in the discussion. Uh, and, and, and I think uh, in these dialogues that we have been planning, we will certainly make sure that there's the diaspora voice. On the opportunities, I would say that there are two opportunities. The first is the COVID crisis has created an opportunity to improve health systems in Africa. And governments now understand that the crisis this will bring. Let me say, uh, German, also uh, that yesterday, last night, our health minister provided the nation with the statistics. By September, we will have 1 million infections in South Africa, and the prognosis is that we will have 40,000 deaths in South Africa. This is coming officially from the government. So, yes, there will be 
uh, a crisis uh, in the near future. What we have done with lockdowns is just postpone it. The, the second thing then is that uh, I think it is a big mistake to postpone the strategic discussions on the EU-Africa relationship. I think even despite this crisis, it, and because of this crisis, it is even more important that there be a track that continues to pursue this relationship because what we will be dealing with is the symptoms. We will not be dealing with the cause, but the strategic partnership will be dealing with the cause. And therefore, I think that that must continue. And lastly, just let me say that, you know, Said raised the issue. The, the geopolitical competition is not going to be helpful. Right now, uh, we are seeing it get even deeper and deeper. And we are afraid in Africa, we are having this discussion all the time. We cannot again be sacrificed on the altar of geopolitical competition. And here, I think Europe must also, uh, we would like our friends in Europe because Gunilla and Mariana and all of our friends that are sitting here, uh, you know, we need to have a new reset in the global order. One that where they, we do away with this geopolitical uh, competition and maybe Europe and Africa can be, in a sense, a non-aligned mediator in this kind of relationship. I think that will help us to reset relationships globally and that we respect national interest. But let's pursue national interest through global responsibility. Thank you, Cedric. Thank you very much, Vasu. I'm going to hand straight over to Susie so we don't take uh, too much time from uh, from the second session. So Susie, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Cedric. And um, uh, if I could just introduce myself uh, because I feel like I'm one of the few people in this virtual room that doesn't know everybody else looking at the chat, uh, chat room comments. My name's Susie Dennison um, and I'm from the European Council on Foreign Relations. And it's been a real pleasure um, for, for me both to be involved with all of our partners in bringing today together, uh, but also um, in, in sitting in on the discussion so far, which has been really fascinating. What we want to do with the second part, as Cedric has said, is to look forward now um, to uh, sort of what uh, this picture means for, for the Europe-Africa partnership going forward um, and indeed some of our speakers um, have already started to um, uh, to do that for us. I think this picks up very um, nicely from, from where Vasu just left off in fact. Um, but to kick us off in the second part um, I'd like to give the floor to my colleague um, Mark Leonard um, who's the founding director of ECFR to share some um, thoughts on precisely um, the this uh, picture that other uh, this question that others have alluded to um, about sort of how COVID-19 is affecting geopolitical dynamics and, and what this might mean uh, for, for Africa and Europe within this project. So Mark, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, very happy to be uh, in such wonderful company. We're really excited to be working with, with all the different partners, with Accord, with NUKP, but also um, with the Norwegian government who uh, have been a wonderful partner on lots of issues over the years and for us this is a really important uh, project because it feeds into uh, a big move uh, within ECFR to, to start uh, addressing some of the issues coming out of the relationship between Europeans and Africans which we think is going to be an absolutely central challenge for, uh, for the world but also above all for, for Europe and we want to try and work out what some of the pillars of a, of a much more 21st century relationship could look like which goes beyond simply focusing on on uh, some of the short-term crises around migration um, and which is not simply determined by the sort of historical relationships which a lot of member states uh, bring to the to, to bear but looks at um, EU Africa relations in the context of this new world which is uh, growing up around us and I'm, I'm going to start with a few thoughts about that new world, which uh, was uh, already shaping before the, the COVID-19 crisis emerged, but which I think the COVID-19 crisis brings very much into, into, into focus. And then to think about how they affect Africa in particular and, and how they might change the dynamics for an EU-Africa partnership. So I think that the, the corona crisis has, has struck a, an international order which was already in a state of crisis and which was being remodeled by three big mega trends. The first was a, an increasing backlash against globalization, which is playing out 
uh, both at the, the international level, but above all through domestic politics, particularly in a lot of uh, Western countries, where uh, increasingly there's a backlash against cross-border flows of labor, global supply chains, um, uh, migration, um, and what we're seeing is both in the countries which people are uh, ar arriving in and those that they come from, uh, a much more politicized debate around the, the aspect of my as a sort of a, a, an intensification on the, the more kind of traditional questions to do with outsourcing and, and supply chains. The second big trend which feeds into that is, a, is the increased great power competition, particularly between China and America, who are increasingly creating not what many people in China thought we were going to see, which was a multipolar world, but rather the beginnings of a bipolar competition, which are playing their way out through everything, um, uh, economic issues, international issues, but above all through the third um, big trend, which I think is an increasing instrumentalization and hollowing out of the, the multilateral and legal order. And what we're seeing is that many things that we thought of as global public goods are in fact being turned into the big battleground for this US-China dispute in the 21st century because neither side wants to uh, play out this competition through traditional uh, uh, means like war. What we're seeing is a weaponization of uh, a lot of the, the, the institutions and the ties that bind us together. And that manifests itself in trade wars, in technology wars, but also through uh, the whole way that every single multilateral organization from the World Trade Organization to the IMF to the World Health Organization are being uh, factored into particularly American and, and, and uh, 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 policy where you see things like um, the global financial system becoming instruments of American foreign policy rather than than, uh, than global public goods. And that's mirrored, if, if the US side is about the weaponization of, 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 uh, of, of international institutions, the Chinese side is more uh, done through the, 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 um, the, the use of Chinese investment and, and state-owned enterprises who are changing the economic dynamics on the ground in different places and changing the economic order in every region of the world. So how do those three trends play out in Africa? I think Africa in many ways is, is the central um, theater in which we're seeing a lot of these uh, trends uh, being uh, operationalized in different ways, but also it, which creates both challenges, but also opportunities. So uh, the debates around globalization and diversification, um, both threaten some of the, the, the opportunities for, for aid, development assistance, financing as, as Western countries uh, potentially move, become more inward looking. But the idea of diversifying supply chains could also be an enormous opportunity for Africa if uh, things like the, the ideas rep, which um, Joseph Burrell, the EU high, uh, high representative, um, on international affairs start happening, which is uh, to see some of the dependence on, on China in particular being changed into a, into a kind of more, into a thought about more diverse and, and shorter supply chains could have uh, important implications for, 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 for countries which are much closer to, to, to Europe. Secondly, um, the ge geopolitical competition does mean that both China and the US see almost everything through the lens of, of their competition. And there's a, a big debate now about how China is going to um, resp respond to the economic shocks in Africa um, and uh, how it will use its situation as, as the single biggest source of, uh, of, of finance to Africans with 143 billion US dollars of debt, Africa already has 20%, sorry, China already has 20% of African debt on its books. And the remainder is split between the major multilateral uh, international financial institutions where the US exercises control and the private sector. So I, I think it's quite likely that this geopolitical competition will uh, come out in, in uh, discussions about, uh, about debt politics um, and as the G20 agreement in response to COVID-19 only covers bilateral debt, um, 
and China holds all the African uh, bilateral debt, I think China is going to be in a very powerful uh, uh, situation in terms of, sh of shaping that. But that could provide uh, potentially um, African countries with, with leverage over Europeans and, and Americans um, into uh, trying to, to, to diversify the, their, their, their future in the, in, in, um, as we go onwards. And the third uh, trend, this instrumentalization of the multilateral order, both uh, means that the role of African countries who have so many votes and so much representation in, in international institutions becomes very important, but it also, I think, is likely to result in regional organizations playing a much more important part as global organizations become bogged down and paralyzed by this uh, weaponization. So um, what does that all mean for EU-Africa relations? And I'll, I'll sort of uh, be very brief because there, there is a lot of expertise here. But I, I think that it does mean that there is an opportunity to move beyond uh, the sort of relatively narrow focus that we've had in the last couple of years uh, on migration suppression, terrorism, anti-piracy issues, and to think about how we could build a much more... Um, uh, uh, multi-dimensional relationship between uh, the European Union and Africa. Um, people have talked about some of the institutional opportunities that we have, but I think that COVID-19 does uh, put the issue of our interdependence with Africa very much to the fore and does particularly put a focus on human development and human capital as well as the, the kind of traditional focus that, that we've had in recent times about building infrastructure and, and the role which other players have, have been having in Africa. So I think that's potentially a big opportunity. I think that there is um, going to be an important uh, dimension about how, how Europe finds a role for itself um, and how it, it deals with the dissonance with its vision for, for relations with Africa, with the growing Chinese role and the growing uh, role of, of, of other uh, players. Europe doesn't have the, the, the kind of necessary financial fire, firepower to act as an alternative to, to China in Africa. But there are lots of opportunities for Europe having more creative ideas about uh, being part of, of Africa's future, whether it's looking at, at reallocating some of Europe's share of SDRs, thinking about ECB swap lines, creating some kind of special purpose vehicle for, for privately held debt. Um, and Europeans also obviously have an important influence on, on the, the private debt and, and the, the role that private banks are going to play in the next period of time. But uh, what I hope we can do is to think uh, through this process about how we can get a better integration of some of these short-term issues which have been dominating the EU-Africa uh, relationship in the past with the longer-term vision which is going to be developing in both Africa and in Europe about the shape of, of a global economy which I think could be changed fundamentally uh, partly as a result of the, the COVID crisis where we could think about much more creative ways of, of, uh, of dealing both with, with supply chains, with uh, our uh, future to, uh, in terms of border management and, and, and demographics, if we look forward over the next few decades, but also uh, on this question uh, of uh, how we deal with the climate emergency, which is going to be uh, another central element of, uh, of, of, of Europe's recovery plans. And finally, uh, what our common digital future is, which is going to be, I think, an important part of how many European countries um, uh, uh, escape from the lockdown, which we're currently in at the moment. Uh, but it, I think is an increasingly important part of our partnership with Africa, this idea of, of how we deal with data, how we deal with regulatory frameworks and how we build the, the infrastructure for a 21st century digital future. So I think those are some of the elements which will go alongside the more traditional uh, relationships to do with 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 um, with development and with um, uh, security, where Europe has got long-standing relationships with with uh, with both AU institutions, but with a, a number of different African countries. Thanks very much indeed, Mark, um, uh, for, uh, for, for that really, uh, you really packed a lot in um, uh, for, for us to pick on now. I'd, I'd like to turn um, straight, if I may, um, to Fatan um, Agad. Um, great to have you with us, Fatan. Um, it, we, uh, we've heard from uh, a number of speakers already today um, 
about sort of a sense of frustration that the um, the dialogue between um, Europe and Africa, um, which was kind of the big priority on the European foreign policy side at the beginning of this year, has um, is maybe slightly sort of knocked off course by the the current international picture. We've heard from Mark um, uh, about a number um, of, of of different themes um, that uh, that in some ways we're already part of that conversation um, around the new um, strategy, um, but we might want to kind of rethink the conversation around that at this point. It would be really interesting to hear sort of from your perspective, um, how do you see um, the, the sort of the, um, the, the next phase um, uh, from the African Union point of view playing out in terms of um, the development of this new partnership, this restart? What are the kind of the files, the points that you think we need to watch um, uh, that um, will be kind of a particular priority from the African Union point of view. Yeah. Thanks Susie um, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks again for, for involving us in, in this discussion. Um, let me, let me um, uh, focus on some, I'd say around five points um, on, on, uh, as to the priorities. Um, moving beyond the emergent um, uh, emergency responses that we're seeing uh, that we're seeing at the moment, and try to position that in a um, in, a, in a, a more general, I would say, uh, forward-looking type of uh, uh, type of uh, assessment. Um, first, what I wanted to point out to is that, um, as, as some of you may be aware, the Economic Commission for Africa released a new estimate as to uh, the. Uh, um, financial uh, stimulus that African countries would uh, need to, to weather uh, the current uh, economic crisis. Um, and it, uh, it, um, uh, uh, the, the, new, the new revision, or the, it, it revised its initial estimate of a requirement of a, around $100 billion uh, to $200 billion. So um, in, in that sense, uh, the amount of, of resources required for, for Africa to, to weather the economic crisis, at least to try and cushion some of it, has, has doubled. And um, so what we know is that uh, you know, no amount of, if I take it back to our relations with Europe, no amount of development aid will be able to, to, to respond to that need. Um, the European Commission, I believe, was mentioned earlier, uh, provided some uh, reallocation. I need to on that. It's not fresh money. I think as Ambassador uh, uh, Jenny uh, mentioned that reallocated some resources, um, which in itself will have some consequences on, you know, other development projects that are as, 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 uh, as important. Um, and even that amount of money remains very far from these 200 billion. So we need to think in the medium term, certainly, um, very differently. And I think that's again a challenge for the African continent on how it will uh, uh, finance uh, the uh, response, the economic response to, uh, to the crisis. Um, and, and the, the, the process that offers most opportunities is the one of the continental free trade area. Um, the uh, entry into force of that, of that uh, uh, agreement is, is, is critical. Um, also because there is a realization that we need to move beyond, uh, beyond the traditional ways really of, of, of uh, uh, stimulating our economies. Um, there's a lot of talk now with the impact of COVID and it was, it was mentioned just by the previous speaker of uh, diversification of supply chains. And I wanted to actually uh, get into my, my point through that particular, uh, through that particular point. Um, COVID, the situation at the moment offers certainly an opportunity for the African continent to position itself uh, even globally uh, in this agenda that we will probably see coming up uh, of, of uh, the diversifying supply chains to try and uh, reduce a bit the, uh, the, the high dependence uh, on, on China, for instance. Um, but let us not forget that um, for us to be able to successfully do that, the CFTA is critical, but so is infrastructure financing. Um, as you know, the continent has around 100 billion infrastructure uh, financing gap per year, um, which, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about aid, um, uh, most, uh, sorry, about debt, 
um, most of the debts that Africa has, has accumulated are actually uh, uh, commercial loans specifically to fill that uh, infrastructure gap. Um, so we find ourselves in a in a situation where uh, to be able to uh, to to overcome some of the immediate challenges of high dependence on you know, on aid, for instance, to finance infrastructure, which is impossible, um, on on the need to diversify our economy uh, to to uh, through, for instance, the CFTA, where the one option that we have available is actually debt. Um, and so um, with that, what I wanted to also uh, uh, say is that um, I see that really as an opportunity um, in terms of the partnership, uh, the partnership with the EU. What we know, and I think that is a challenge that came up even within the EU when it was discussing, for instance, the uh, support packages that would go to southern European countries, that the issue of in depth that the debt was particularly uh, important, how um, rating agencies would, would respond, how the financial market would respond if one country individually went to accumulated debt or if the entire union accumulated debt, etc. Um, that particular conversation shows to us that there is a very fundamental issue in terms in, in the way the international or uh, the global debt architecture is structured, the international financial markets are structured. And, uh, and I think that needs a, a global discussion. It needs a, a, an international debate on how we will uh, move in the new uh, uh, global economic order with a new, financial, uh, a new financial system. And there I do think that uh, there is potential certainly uh, for Europe and Africa to, to, to come together on, on that particular agenda. Because again, I think it, it, it was uh, uh, raised earlier, um, there are a lot of differences, a lot of, there's a lot of diversity within Europe as much as it is within Africa. And I think we will see a lot of impact on um, some European economies uh, that, that, that is very, very um, important in a way that will require us to, to, to rethink really the way uh, the global financial system uh, is structured. Um, so, um, so the potential, the, 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 the key opportunity for Africa uh, to, to, to weather the crisis really depends on, 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 on how we will, in the medium term, how we will successfully implement the CFTA. Um, but that again has uh, the, the link to debt, the, the link to infrastructure financing is very critical there. And I think the support of the international community, and particularly Europe, um, in, in, in um, uh, having a conversation that goes beyond the politics of debt, uh, ge the geopolitics of it, and on where Africa is getting its debt from, et cetera, or accumulating its debt from, etc. I think we need to move beyond that. I think we need to start finding concrete solutions uh, to be able to support the economic agenda uh, of the continent. Um, the next point that I wanted to raise is that um, in the medium term, what this crisis has showed to us is that we will need to um, put again the role of the state at the center of our cooperation. Um, the uh, the EU has been uh, diversifying its its support uh, at, at times due to some pressure moving away from the state. Um, uh, but, but I think again, this crisis shows that the role of the state is critical. The private sector has been extremely useful. This is Africa, where uh, you've had the telecom companies are offering. I believe a hundred terabytes to the health ministry to be able to uh, to report live uh, results of tests to be able to have a a, a real time picture of, of 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 the spread of the disease or in Nigeria where we've seen a group of philanthropists and and, and the banking sector coming together to uh, support also the health uh, the health sector uh, through the provision of beds or um, the tech volunteers in Ethiopia or in Sierra Leone trying to develop apps to be able to uh, support again health workers and health ministries in tracking the spread of the disease there I think the the role of the of the of the private sector uh, was useful it was complementary but the role of the state remains central and I think crises like these show us again that uh, uh, providing or, or having a, a state capability and I would agree with Vasu there it's not only a capacity of the state but its capability to uh, to, to, to 
to lead responses, to be able to uh, offer. Uh, uh, I mean, if I take, for instance, the current the current situation, it's very difficult for most of African countries, with the exception of South Africa, that put 10% of its GDP uh, as a, reserved it as as, a, as an economic stimulus. Most of African countries. Uh, do not simply do not have the fiscal space to do that, um, and so these responses will come from uh, uh, if we want large scale uh, responses to be able to respond to crises such as the one that we have now. Really, the role of the state is critical. Um, the the next the other point that I wanted to raise is that again, what the situation has showed us is that um, regional organisations are important. Um, the role of the AU and the African uh, Center for Disease Controls, uh, uh, disease control was uh, was was uh, uh, highlighted uh, by by different speakers, um, but there is potential in others too. I think we uh, the the African uh, Risk Capacity Agency, for instance, is one of those um, that can you know working with it potentially uh, provide some opportunities in terms of financing some of these uh, uh, some of the initiatives that we. Will see later on, but the role of regional organisations, again, as we have seen now, is is critical, and it will continue to be critical, um, even in, in in the medium term, as as we seek to uh, to find uh, solutions, um, uh, particularly to the economic uh, to the economic crisis. I just wanted to conclude on two points. Um, the first is to say that. Um, I think the key challenge uh, when we uh, speak of, of Europe-Africa uh, relations between the EU and the EU in future um, is, is, um, is the need to move beyond inputs. Huh? We often talk about how much money has been given, how many dialogues have taken place, how many summits are we having, etc. It's always about the input. I think Vasu, when he referred to the, the, the move to a more qualitative type of engagement, um, I would agree. I think it's a very critical point that we need to, 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 to look into. And I think the real test at the moment, and if you speak to uh, several African, uh, uh, even uh, government representatives, um, they often speak of deliverables, the need to have very clear deliverables to be outcome driven uh, when we uh, look at the future of the partnership now be, uh, between uh, Europe and Africa. So move beyond inputs, focus on the outcomes that they are delivering on. Uh, the last point that I wanted to uh, put emphasis on, it was actually also raised by other speakers, is that we need to imagine our relationships between the, the, the Europe and Africa um, beyond the China effect. Um, I think we have um, uh, so far been a bit too caught up uh, to the point that we stopped um, again imagining our relationship in its own right. Um, and I think that is that is a key challenge. I think there is a lot of potential in the in the partnership where close neighbors. Um, uh, there are a lot of there are a lot of um, uh, uh, human human exchange between the two continents. Um, that is actually capital uh, that we need to uh, to use. Um, but to be able to look at the relationship uh, and and to take it to the next step, um, we need to stop talking about competition. We can't avoid the geopolitics of it. It is there, um, but as a starting point, we shouldn't look at a uh, relationship with third parties, but first and foremost uh, to our relationship um, between the two continents. Thanks. Thank you very much indeed, Fatin. Um, that was that was super um, super helpful. I think um, for for us all um, uh, to, to sort of think about the next phase in that way. I, I want to now open um, up the floor. Um, we have around ten minutes um, left for for questions and comments. Um, maybe um, while people are thinking about whether they want to come in or not, I will just raise um, a question that has been asked in in the chat room, um, which maybe um, uh, Fatin, this might be something that you could comment on in in your capacity as um, advisor to the African Union High Commissioner um, 
but also might be interesting to hear on this um, from, I know there's a number of participants here from EU institutions on um, sort of thinking about the, the quality um, of, of the dialogue um, rather than inputs and, and deliverables. Um, what do you think the prospects are of um, moving the conversation into a sort of a virtual setting, if indeed you agree that this is a quality conversation we're having here today, um, and focus more on, um, uh, yeah, the, the sort of the substance of it um, rather than um, the, the date and an in-person meeting? So interested to hear sort of any reactions to that from either an AU or an EU perspective. I'm, I'm not in a position to comment on that, um, but uh, but there are discussions obviously behind the scenes to, uh, uh, to, 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 to see what is feasible and, and what is not. Great. Thank you very much. Um, anybody else like to come in um, at this point? I will, I will um, maybe uh, from from my side, I'll um, I'll, I'll I'll add a question. Um, I uh, sort of coming back to this um, this theme about um, uh, the the sort of the way that um, the, uh, the this this particular crisis um, around COVID has made us think about um, uh, how we react um, and how we cooperate on that uh, at a continent to con continent level, and the extent this idea that I think came out in, in a number of speakers' comments that um, in some ways um, this experience has highlighted the extent to which um, uh, African and European interests are closely aligned um, on, on, some, on some issues and that we are um, interdependent. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, uh, I think uh, that uh, this has sort of added global health to a list that we already knew was there from um, uh, from climate change to managing migration to managing um, uh, the economic challenges and um, what what is um, what is your sense about whether that will be a sort of um, a lasting learning um, and that that, that, that 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 will have a sort of a dynamic on the discussions going forward on the Africa Europe Europe partnership um, uh, or, or whether um, this this is this, this sort of risks being um, another area um, that becomes a source of um, sort of uh, tension between the, um, the the continents in in, in the dialogue. Yes, uh, Said Jinich, I'd give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I I, I just want to about, to make a comment and. Uh, it has been made by other colleagues who took the floor earlier. I mean, I am impressed by one thing. The, this pandemic has taken all of us by surprise. It is undermining our undertakings, our uh, projects, I mean, at national, continental, regional level, at even individual level. Uh, but what has, the, the impact which I have seen is it has, it has humbled us all. It has humbled everybody. I am in Europe. And they have seen how Europe has felt for once vulnerable. It was so, so, so sure, so comfortable in its position that it is in control of the situation. It has not been in control of COVID. I mean, let's see that they, they have not been, uh, they could not anticipate and the reaction was quite chaotic initially. But of course, Europe has the capacity to cope with the, with the, with, with the impact. But still, it has been taken by surprise, but in the process, it has been humbled. And of course, Africa has been always humble anyway, but it has been further humbled by this, uh, by this pandemic. So, in a sense, this is a new beginning. People have been talking about resetting the, the relations between Africa and Europe. And I think it's the time. The, the attitude should change. And many colleagues have said that we should learn from Africa. Of course, Africa should learn a lot from Europe. And as you know, we have taken Europe as the example. In the transformation from the OE to the AU, we have established the model of Europe, the commission, because we think the best thing is to bring countries together, to develop, to trade together, to make peace sustainable. The example of, of Europe. That's why we in Africa have a stake in the success of the uh, European project. We are a little bit, uh, always we are a little bit uh, sad when we hear of the setbacks of the Europe because we want Europe to succeed because African Union, we want it also to succeed. But it's important for the future relation that is strategic, audacious, modern, serious, 
to be based on humility, that we should look at each other as good partners. Africa is clearly a continent of potential for Europe. So it's not only, we should not look at Africa as only conflict, crisis, migrants. We should look at Africa as a continent of where the potential is for Europe. So that's why inspiring each other is the key for the future strategy and humility from both sides and looking and not looking at each other that will make the strategy work. I think we should uh, reset the, the relation, the terms of the relation. And I strongly believe that this is a golden opportunity to reframe the strategy, the strategy between the EU and the Africa in, on, a solid, on a solid basis. Excuse me. Sorry, I had my mute on. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, I want to now give the floor to Salo Petri, um, please. Uh, it's uh, basically, thank you very much, Petri Salo from the MFA in Finland, uh, from the Africa and uh, Middle East Department. Uh, Fatan had a reference to the, com uh, the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, and also a reference to the to the debt issue, uh, as I as I think um, somebody earlier, maybe Kunila Carson, uh, was referring to it. Uh, well, at least he was referring to remittances, and there there is some in interesting data where, where for example, uh, re regarding to investments, uh, foreign direct investments, that the remittances could be almost twice as much uh, yearly. Uh, uh, on the continental um, uh, GDP uh, as as are, uh, are, are the FDI, uh, and w what about the the my my in a way my question I suppose is to to Fatan maybe maybe also to Mark Leonard that uh, regarding the African Free Trade Agreement uh, now we are uh, due to COVID we are in a situation where not only in Africa but also uh, in Europe, all over the world, countries are, notably the, the public sectors are suffering of, of uh, uh, well, not only the public sector, the, the private sector as well, of course, uh, of uh, economically badly. And, and we are in, in short of, of um, money, basically, of, of uh, uh, investment. Thank you. Africa, Africa would need 100, uh, 200 million now, a uh, billion, sorry. Uh, what about the private sector? Because now, now the public sector is in debt everywhere and is, is taking enormous debts to support private sector in Europe, in the United States. Uh, sort of just fabulous sums. What about the private sector? Because that, that there is still a lot of money that is idle at the moment on the private sector. How to... Um, attract the private money uh, FDI to Africa. And I think a free trade agreement would be a, a good answer to that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for your question. So um, I'm going to um, hand the floor then back to, um, we'll do it in reverse order, um, Fatan and then Mark. I will um, ask you um, both to um, sort of respond to that um, or, or, or other comments that, that you wish to. There was also a particular question for Fatan um, in the chat box um, uh, asking whether or not you think that the March communication on the Europe-Africa strategy is indeed a good starting point. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like if I could to give you both um, a minute each to respond and then I'm going to hand the floor to Ulf Svedrup to um, give us some key takeaways um, uh, from, the, from the discussion. Thank you. Let me first start by the question of, of um, um, remittances and, and FDI. Um, the prediction for this year is that remittances to Africa will decline by 25% uh, because obviously of, of the impact that uh, uh, that is felt elsewhere um, and, and may, may result in the diaspora not sending uh, more money. I mean, obviously, there's the, the issue also of, of, of uh, transfer uh, costs uh, that remains uh, unbearably high for the continent. And now, I mean, although we've seen a decline since 2005, it's still relatively, uh, relatively low. So that will actually create some shock. And some countries, if you take Senegal, for instance, has already Really raise that as a key issue uh, that will potentially have a big impact on, on uh, uh, 
uh, on its on its economy. Um, uh, remittances represent three times the development aid amount that Senegal, for instance, receives. It's five more than five percent of. Uh, represents more than 5% of Nigeria's GDP. So a lot of countries, um, East and West Africa, and North Africa in particular, uh, will be affected. Um, um, so, so indeed, with that reducing, uh, development aid reducing, um, then is the private sector uh, potentially, uh, an FDI potentially a source. Um, the, um, the, the, the reality is that FDI or, or investors generally still see Africa as a, uh, as a high risk uh, region. And so um, some of the partners have been looking at uh, or have already implemented the, uh, or offered some guarantees to stimulate that, uh, that investment, the EU being, uh, uh, being one of, of, of those partners. Unfortunately, up to now, we haven't seen, I mean, although, for, I mean, this model has been implemented uh, for a few years, um, but there's, we, we see very little uh, uh, results, um, perhaps also because little is communicated to that effect. Um, um, and so, I mean, whether FDI will or not be a solution, I'm, I'm, I'm not too convinced. I think the crisis is, is, is global. Um, and and I think several even private uh, private investors will be will be affected unless there is a some type of stimulus package or some type of uh, of, of, of incentives that are introduced in these uh, major stimulus packages that uh, Europe is introducing or, or North America. And to to, to do that, very briefly, Susie, on, on on the March communication. Um, whether it is still relevant, was that the question? Whether it's a good starting point. Whether it's a good starting point. I think, look, the EU, like anybody else, does have the right to develop whichever strategy it wants to develop, um, as long as we are clear that that is the EU strategy. On the African side, there is um, there is a discussion. There's a there there is a document, uh, um, and I think what would be ideal as we move forward is to merge these two together, um, uh, as as part of, of a uh, negotiation slash discussion process in the lead up to the summit. Um, but I think the EU, like the EU, has its own right to develop whatever documents it wants to develop and, and set its vision. Uh, put its vision in writing. Um, but very briefly, I think, on, 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 again, on that particular point, I think the challenge will be, uh, the devil will be in the details. If, I'm, if I take a, 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 the issue of, of, of trade, for instance, um, the CFTA is a central piece of the puzzle uh, for the AU. Uh, for 54 countries have signed up to with 32 have so far ratified so it is a critical critical process uh, for the EU the EU has been saying that it does support the CFTA um, but with the economic partnership agreements as their basis uh, which which so it's about how the jigsaw comes together <laughs> uh, and so we need to go and have a real discussion on what support to the CFTA uh, does mean and the same applies actually in different sectors Thank you. Okay, then, Ulf, I will hand the floor over to you um, to, uh, to, to close the discussion. Okay, thank you so much, Susie. Thank you to all of you who have contributed. Thank you to ECFR, to Accord, and of course, my great colleagues at NUPI for contributing to this. Uh, you have covered many topics today. It's really difficult to summarize, but if I were to mention just three brief takeaway points, that I think might guide our discussion also as we go along. And let me just mention them briefly. The first is we discussed quite extensively the short term kind of issues and very important issues related to COVID-19. And of course, there are considerable uncertainty regarding the health impact of, of the crisis. Uh, WHO report published on Friday estimated that by within the year, around 20% 20, 20 of Africans will be infected and possibly 150,000 people will die in Africa this year. So that in itself raises huge issues regarding access to healthcare, to medicine, 
and potential access to vaccine if that is made available. Um, Vasu also uh, stressed, of course, how the COVID-19 might be a, a conflict multiplier, partly on the short term on domestic violence, but also on the long run because the economic instability is created. And I think that uh, I, my takeaway point is that in this panel here, we heard that the economic prospects are pretty dim. Uh, African countries are hurt by the lockdown, by the decline of tourism. I've also seen some studies of a possible drop in remittances and possibly also drop in aid. And of course, Africa is hurt almost uh, unproportionately by disruption in global value chains, reversal of investment flows, depreciation of currencies, and also drop in commodity prices. So, so this is a very serious crisis. Uh, the second takeaway point relates to the link between the short-term challenges on the crisis and the long-run challenges. Uh, we have heard that uh, COVID-19 has disrupted some of the short-term dialogues between Europe and Africa, but also possibly triggered uh, understanding of the importance of these dialogues. Uh, and Alain Leroy brought up the very important issue on initiatives of debt and financing. And we've heard all other people bringing up issues related to climate change, digitalization, migration, security, etc. And the importance of developing the capacity, capability, and legitimacy in dealing with the crisis. And the third takeaway point, I think, is that some of you have touched upon, is that the Europe-Africa relationship is also very much about the political vision. It's, uh, we have seen that this is a global crisis. Some retreat to nationalism, but many also understood that this is a wake-up call to recognize that we have some kind of shared destiny. Uh, more humility, as said, Jim had stressed, and a vision of quality and equality, as Vasu alluded to. Um, in addition to this, I see the Europe-Africa relationship is also a test case for a more coordinated European foreign policy. And in some sense, the role of Europe also in the larger multilateral system in an age of geopolitical rivalry, as Mark Leonard brought up and focused on. So I think we have touched a broad set of issues related to all three of these issues. And I think we have a lot of things to discuss as we go along. And I thank you all for your participation and involvement. And, and uh, I look forward to the next webinar, Susie. Yes, thank you very much. As, as Ulf says, um, we'll be back in touch with you very shortly. We're looking, this is part of the very the first one of a dialogue series um, around this partnership that we'll be looking at. And um, before the summer break, we're planning to um, set something up looking at this geopolitical context with a particular focus on Russia and Africa. So thank you very much for participating today and look forward to seeing you again soon.